Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm so glad we have so many wonderful people here to uh, welcome Daryl and to hear his talk. We've got about 25 people joining us and I know we'll have some more popping on as we get going. Uh, my name's Katie and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Heritage Trust and I'd just like to welcome you all tonight and thank you for joining us on the Zoom. And I'm going to pass it over to Don Dietrich, one of our board members, to introduce Daryl and get us rolling for the evening. We'll be using the chat function tonight, so if you have questions or whatnot throughout the evening, feel free to type in there and um, I'll be kind of monitoring that in the background and keeping us going. So take it away, Don. Thank you so much, Katie. So um, I'm Dawn Dietrich. I'm on the board of the Lummi Island Heritage Trust, and I'm so happy to welcome you here tonight. I really wish I could see all of your faces. I don't really like this webinar format where <laughs> I only see the presenters, but welcome to everyone. I'm going to visualize that you're out there. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the lands we are on today are the original and ancestral and current homelands of the Lactamish, the Lummi people, who are the original inhabitants of Washington's northernmost coast, the San Juan Islands and Southern British Columbia, being the original fishers, hunters, gatherers, and harvesters of this region. They have worked, struggled, and celebrated life on the shores and waters of the Salish Sea, and they continue their traditional ways of life and land management practices today. The Lummi Nation currently leads the fight against ongoing environmental crises, uh, such as fossil fuel dependency, coal transportation, green crab infestations, decreasing salmon runs, and the declining health of the Nooksack River, all huge issues facing our region. And, uh, and, and the nation and the world. The Lummi Island Heritage Trust extends our respect and gratitude for the environmental leadership of the Lactamish people and their enduring care and protection of these shared uh, lands and waterways. But we also realize that land acknowledgements are nothing without action. There is more that we can do to educate ourselves, to acknowledge historical injustices, and to think deeply about what land preservation means, who has access to the land, and who benefits from conservation efforts. As we go forward, and I speak these words very humbly, we hope to see our words turn into greater actions that honor our values, as well as the values of the Lummi Nation. We hope to preserve spaces and to steward land in ways that acknowledge both indigenous and settler histories, and which are accessible and welcoming to all people. Thus, it is a great honor to feature Elder Daryl Hilaire as the second presenter in our speaker series entitled, The Stories We Tell About Nature, The Stories Nature Tells About Us. Mr. Hilaire was an obvious choice for this series as his work with Children of the Setting Sun Productions has centered on Coast Salish storytelling through digital media. And what is the Salmon People Project if not the story the salmon is telling about us humans? Mr. Hilaire serves as the executive director of Children of the Setting Sun Productions. And some of you will remember the acclaimed play he wrote in 2013 entitled, What About Those Promises About the Treaty of Point Elliot? He originally founded Children of the Setting Sun Productions to stage this play, and the organization has since grown to be a premier production company, which produces and directs indigenous films, um, sponsors indigenous film festivals, supports youth leadership and digital storytelling, provides commercial video and audio services, and is currently involved in a full documentary series on native salmon peoples in the Western United States and Canada. Though Mr. Hilaire was uh, talking earlier about the importance of the multidisciplinary nature of, of his work and how it extends much beyond spe being a sp specifically a production company. So it'll be really fun to hear him talk more about that. 
Mr. Hilaire is also the co-editor of the forthcoming book, Jess and Tell, Living Wisdom from Coast Salish Elders, which is coming out of the University of Washington Press. And I think it's gonna be available in June, but maybe um, Mr. Hilaire can let us know more specifically when that book is, is um, coming out. But please join me in welcoming Elder Daryl Hilaire. Hi, Shka. Um, hi, Shka. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And, and all of you that are here, the people that are in this room together, uh, first off, uh, uh, thank you for having me back. And my apologies for the disruption last time. I'm, I'm really uh, wanting to uh, really uh, see all of you. And thank you for forgiving me and having me back. Uh, and I'll, I'll have uh, maybe an address from, uh, from Don or somebody to send you a thank you note. I, I wanna do that for everybody here and all those people perhaps for, that were at the uh, originally scheduled date together. So um, <clears throat> first off, I'll, I'd like to introduce uh, Children of the Setting Sun if, if you'd like, and then introduce the Salmon People Project and uh, what that is to, to our company, to our people, and to the people that we're working with. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Children of the Setting Sun uh, Productions. Uh, we're uh, a nonprofit. Uh, this is our sixth year of uh, existence. Um, seven years is coming up in September, and I go, oh my gosh, you know, uh, Don, when you mentioned what about those promises in 2013, you know, that's going to almost 10 years ago, you know, and uh, that, <laughs> it's quite startling to me um, that uh, it's been going by really fast and this part of my life, you know, and in this part of my life, Children of the Setting Sun uh, was born uh, as a nonprofit when I retired from the Lummi Nation as uh, a member of their council, but also as the director for the Lummi Youth Academy, which took up most of my life's work. And I uh, thought, well, what am I gonna do now? And it was almost an easy thing to do to form a nonprofit and continue to tell stories. But uh, the real story is though, that even though we're in a seventh year, almost seventh year of our existence, Children of the Setting Sun's been around for about 120 years. Uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Chetalak, Frank Hilaire, um, was a young boy at treaty signing. He was 10 years old and was on the canoe that went down to Mukilteo to sign the treaty. The elders at that time put little boys and girls in those canoes to go down to Mukilteo to witness the work. And we're reminded by the elders to never forget about those promises that were made at Muckleteo in 1855. So they, they were there uh, with a huge responsibility. So Frank Hilaire Haitaluk uh, took that very seriously. So when he became an elder, uh, he's seen what was happening in this, this uh, place we call home, the amount of people moving into this territory, the amount of people that didn't know uh, the Lummi people, didn't know what we stood for and what we believed in. So he, feel, he formed a dance group, Children of the Setting Sun. And he traveled around uh, the Pacific Northwest and he told the stories. He sang the songs and he danced the dances and told uh, the people here that this is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is what we believe. And he did that for the rest of his life until he died. And when he died, then he passed it on to his son, Joseph Hilaire. And I, I welcome people to write these names down and, and Google it, you know, because they do show up on the internet. And Joe Hilaire took on the next version of Children of the Setting Sun. So we had the original version, which was Ketelak and, and his contemporaries and the people more his age. And then the second version was my dad and my, all of my dad's uh, first cousins like Sam Kagey, like Joe Washington, uh, Margaret Green, all of Pauline Hilaire. They were all the second version of the Children of the Setting Sun. But then when, when uh, Chetelak died, 
when Frank Hilaire died, and then Joe Hilaire took it up. And he came up with a third version of Children of the Setting Sun and did the very same thing. He traveled around and shared our stories. And then when he passed on, there became many versions because all those, all those grandkids had dance groups. Sam Kagey, Jack Kagey, Pauline Hilaire, Sam Kagey, Joe Washington, Uncle Smitty, James Hilaire, they all had versions of this work and took it out into the many places that we call home, our homeland, the many places from, from Vancouver to California and, and continued that work. And so then uh, as they began to pass on and, and these, and these uh, stories just started to fade, uh, we formed a war canoe called the Setting Sun Canoe Club to carry on that name. And we did that until I, until I got old and fat and then we hung up the paddles. And, and now it was a natural today though, to pick up those stories and, and begin that practice in meeting our responsibilities of sharing who we are and where we come from by naming my work, the Children of the Setting Sun Productions. And so that's the, that's the story of, of, of my family and what they did, what they, what they were instructed to do, how they carried on. And we're merely following along with what's been left to us in terms of uh, bringing the people together for, for the betterment of all people. And so that's, that's Children of the Setting Sun. And I'm really happy to share that with you is I feel a, a great sense of responsibility that this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And I have young people working for me that I'm passing this on to. That's, that's very important for me to do that. And so um, in these six years, uh, you know, as you were sharing, Don, we, we had stage productions, you know, and then we did short videos and we're really finding out what our, what our niche is going to be in this market, and as we know, this market is uh, pretty heavily populated, especially today with the internet and technology. You know, the intention getting the intention of people is is quite challenging. But if we stuck to what we know about ourselves and and shared those those beliefs about ourselves, we think we're we're meeting our responsibility because. Ultimately, it is for the next generation and what we can leave our children. So we did that, you know, and um, the real uh, game changer for us though in these last two or three years has been COVID. And in COVID, as everybody was closing, everybody was laying people off, everybody was going home. We actually went into this hiring frenzy because we wanted to be a service to the people. So we started doing a lot, a lot of service work with, um, uh, that started with our, our little Zoom cast called One From The Heart. And we started bringing the people together to share their, their stories, share their grievances, share their worries, share their solutions and their methods of taking care of one another. So One From The Heart brought us, uh, unintended consequences, which means that we became a growing company. <laughs> so uh, Children of the Setting Sun was uh, started by three people, uh, myself and two others, uh, Bo, Garo, and Natasha. But today we have 18 people because of, uh, mainly because of COVID and how we work on things like land acknowledgements, things like graduations. Uh, we, we broadcast uh, Chief Salik's funeral uh, we did some work for Western on their longhouse. So we did work for Ferndale School District on their bond, bonds and levies and, and the like and treaty day videos. And it just, it just really grew like overnight. And so um, that afforded us to really uh, maintain our focus on our, our number one priority, which all along has been um, the importance of salmon to our people. And uh, the Salmon People Project was born out of uh, the Sakai, uh, the Sakai harvest, but most importantly, the Sakai's journey. 
and um, Sakai is recognized by our people as, as our most sacred ancestor. And I began to learn about that and what that really means to our people and all Coast Salish people and people up and down the Fraser River Basin on up into the Adams River, uh, uh, river uh, spawning grounds. And um, in 2010, there was a historic run of sockeye that came through our homeland. And uh, serving on the council, I recognized that. I recognized the vibe. I recognized the elevation of our feelings. I recognized the coming together of families around salmon. And uh, it was such a powerful moment in history for our people for not having fish for, you know, actually uh, almost uh, a decade. And to have the salmon come home was uh, quite miraculous in the lifting of our spirit as a people. So I took note of that and, and knowing that Sakai is on a four year, you know, re return cycle, I came back to it in 2014. I, I noticed not only with my heart, but actually took notes, you know, and and start talking to people. And most notably, uh, the person that was right next to me on the council, our general manager at the time, a, name, a guy by the name of Larry Kinley, who's a great leader, not only for Lummi, but a great leader for the Southern California tribes and for uh, leadership across this country, a man that I uh, have a great deal of respect for. And, um, uh, so I started noting that and I started noting the history of his, his family and how connected they are to the water and connected to salmon and keen on um, what the sockeye means to their family. And um, so witnessed that through 2014, another great return, but not as epic as 2010, but still the spirit of the people was lifted because the other years, those off years, there was there was no fishery and it was pretty glum around our community. Stories weren't being told. Knowledge wasn't being passed on to the young people. The togetherness wasn't being witnessed and the celebration of the salmon on our tables was not taking place. So these things uh, created a, a real um, a drag and a real just heartfelt um, um, sense of loss, you know, for the salmon. And so at that point, then I decided, well, I better start documenting this. So I, um, in the beginning, I had a $300 Sony camera. Now we had to get gear, you know, but in 2018, we actually got out and to Point Roberts, got out to the salmon banks, got out to Lummi Island and started interviewing people and uh, got a lot of great footage going and start bringing the story together around the story of the sockeye, uh, Larry Kinley and his family, and the Lummi people. Those were the three circles that we wanted to intersect. And um, got, got the story going and, and my good friend Larry passed away. Um, and um, we had to put everything away for a year to, in recognition of the family's uh, grief. And so we did, you know. And as that, as that year passed though, I noticed as um, we were getting ready for the, to come out of that and begin the work again, other tribes were identifying as the salmon people, much like Lummi. Reading the headlines of what was taking place on the Klamath River on the Yurok Indian Reservation in Northern California where they are working uh, quite diligently and fighting for salmon there and are getting Warren Buffett to take four dams down off the Klamath River. They declared themselves the salmon people. And I said, well, that got my attention, you know? And then same thing on the Snake River, the Nez Perce wanting those dams removed so that the salmon will not go extinct and saying, we are the salmon people. And then going north to the Fraser River and those people that live at the headwaters of the Adams River where the salmon go back to, harvest, to spawn and give new life. 
have declared themselves the salmon people since time immemorial. And they take that job very seriously up there at Shushwap because they live on this ridge where the headwaters of the Fraser begin. And you go over on the other side, it's the headwaters of the Columbia. And, and they feel it's their responsibility to take care of these uh, places that the salmon come home to spawn and give new life and water is so important to them. So um, I thought, wow, this is a little bit bigger than I, what I thought it was gonna be, but we got to walk towards it. So um, we started uh, traveling to these reservations and traveling to these rivers and getting to know these people and, and hearing stories that are very much like the stories at Lummi, very much the love and deep commitment to protection of the environment and of salmon as the Lummi. And all of these things don't have any commercial uh, value. It's all the values that were uh, instilled in them from their ancestors that they're instilling into their children and grandchildren. The importance of being one with uh, their environment, the salmon and the river, and all those things that have a life but have no voice. And they feel it's really important to speak up for those living beings that don't have a voice. So that's, that's when these things started to come together in way of, we're gonna finish this story about Larry and the Sakai and Lummi people, and that's gonna be in post-production now. But we also decided, well, we're gonna do a project and we're gonna to pull together all of these stories from these people that live on the Fraser River. We're including the lower Elwan, the Alwa River, the uh, Columbia River, the Snake River, the Klamath River, the Still Guamish River. And it, um, it's um, something that we're not overwhelmed with, but understand that we're just gonna stay on this, this uh, one pathway of collecting the stories of the salmon people that'll be uh, structured within a like a four to six part series. So now we have the feature and then we have the six part series. In the middle of this, I, I do know that we decided that we needed to uh, change our mission. And if you go to our website, you can, you can see our mission that we spelled out for ourselves. That's still in, in the in process, I think. We're not all the way there with it. Our original mission was to create, share, and educate indigenous knowledge. Create, share, and educate so that we can learn to live together. That was our original mission. Today, it's been changed to Mother Earth is suffering and that we want to meet the challenge of what needs to be done through storytelling and the sharing of those, those values that we think need to be realized, the, the spirit of uh, the giveaway, the gratitude that needs to be practiced, the respect that needs to be learned, all for those that are yet to come, those, those kids and grandkids and their kids. That's, that's where we're going now. And, um, and that's been put in place now in the middle of what we are witnessing through the Salmon People Project itself. So we have the feature, we have the series, and then we decided as we were sharing earlier that we're, we, we were not wanting to be um, uh, categorized or putting in a uh, silo in such a way that we're only recognized for filmmaking or, you know, native studies or, you know, those things that um, people tend to do to you when they're, you know, trying to figure out, well, where am I going to put this, this company? Are they, what are they, you know? We're, we want to be um, in a position where we're meeting today's problems and today's solutions together in a manner that we think about it holistically. We think about it in an interdisciplinary manner. Uh, we think that's how the world works. And we want to be in line with that. So, and that leads me to the, the next part of the Salmon People Project. Through this 
gathering of these stories through the series and the, and the, and the feature, we went to Western Washington University and we went to Northwest Indian College and we got a research proposal approved by the IRB of both, both institutes. So not only are we gathering stories through film, we're actually doing interviews and, and conducting research so we can uh, provide an analysis of, uh, of what people are saying that'll be of a benefit to academia, be a benefit to, um, to policy, you know, and those policies that uh, will probably need to be informed by um, these kinds of conversations. So now that's, that's the third prong. And the fourth prong is for the people themselves, the salmon people themselves. We're committed to gathering the Sam people uh, once a year. In the first two years, they were both at Zoom. Our intentions were to have them in person, but because of COVID, they ended up being on uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom casts. Uh, I think they're on our website, you can watch them. But the next one is May 11th at Celilo Falls in a, a sacred place to the people of the Columbia River that um, you know, were moved to Yakima and Umatilla and Warm Springs and Nez Perce when treaty was signed, but they're very much connected to and identify with these places that they fished until the dams were put in. So we're going there on actually May 10th and 11th. We're gonna have a women's circle on May 10th. So the women of the river are gonna be there to, uh, to open things up in the way of how uh, women do carry the sacred water of our ancestors. So we, need, uh, we want them to speak to what that is and what, uh, what the river means to uh, us as a people. So that'll be on May 10th and May 11th, we're gonna be participating with uh, Jay Julius and Jewel James and the totem pole journey and they're gonna arrive at Salilo on the 11th. We're gonna join them. So the salmon people and, and their caravan are gonna to join together in a ceremony to feed the river uh, that morning. And then we'll go up to the longhouse after the ceremony and recognize the salmon people and have them to step forward and provide their uh, testimonial to what they're seeing, what they're witnessing in that day and what we need to do together uh, in the days ahead. So uh, that's the kind of gatherings uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, we like to host, we like to sponsor and, and gather the people for. I like to tell the people that we're, we're, uh, our, our intentions are is that we wanna capture the stories from people that have the boots, their boots in the water. That's kind of like number one, we're not, we're not gonna be watching PowerPoints or listening to data and you know we're getting the stories from the people that are living this life we also very intentional about this and that we want to know people to know that the place for science and spirit to come together is in these kinds of places that we bring the spirit of our work to what scientists are saying which is really important you know that you know our systems are failing the ecosystems are failing they're saying that to us, but for some reason, the point isn't getting across. And we thought, oh, maybe we can help, you know, by bringing the spirit of our work together with what they're saying into one. So, and then uh, what else is really important to us is when we gather the people is that we need to, uh, we need to have people understand that the importance of sharing, that we're here to share. We're going to share as, as much as we can and we want you to learn how to share yourself. So those are kind of like our guiding principles in the Salmon People Project. And we're, we do that at our gatherings, we do that in all of the work that we do, whether it's filming or interviewing and the like. So then, so then you have the series and you have the, the, the feature getting done and you have the research. Then we recreated um, a uh, institute for all of this to be housed. It's called the Setting Sun Institute. And it's found within our website. It's, uh, it's, it's being newly formed. Uh, 
And we feel that we want to create a place for this to live on beyond, you know, uh, the project itself. And we think it's important for people to access what we're gathering and take it and use it and strengthen their work and teach their young ones and, and um, make sure that what what's, uh, is uh, being collected can be found in, in such a manner that you're not being frustrated by, you know, how we categorize again stuff, you know, it's all going to be brought together in one place and it's called Setting Sun Institute. So, um, you know, the um, four parts to this requires us to get out and raise a lot of money and campaign and all of that. And uh, I'm, I'm fine with that, you know, um, but I think what's really important to me is um, is to kind of like really just follow the Lummi protocols and follow what uh, what my ancestors were doing before me. And it basically be, could be categorized in kind of like uh, three words, you know, and um, says uh, more uh, so often people ask me, well, what are you doing? You know, and I can give them, I can give this spiel, but what I'm really doing is uh, feeding the people. That's, that's inherent to the Lummi people, inherent to my family. My family's really good at that. I mean, we visualize feeding the people, it's, those gatherings that we go to, you know, whether it be for a funeral or for memorials or for namings or for canoe journey, it's a big responsibility to feed the people. But what we're feeding the people is what we're gathering these stories, this knowledge, these intentions, this, what they carry in their heart, you know, and we want to feed that to the people. So we think that's really important in today's conversations is how can we give of ourselves so that we can learn how to live together, you know, and what better way than to feed the people, you know, both, uh, uh, you know, metaphorically, but also, you know, uh, when we actually do get together, we're going to eat a lot of fish, you know, <laughs> so, but I'd like to, uh, maybe we can open up a little bit and uh, ask questions and maybe uh, can clarify some things for folks and, you know, maybe, you um, take us off into some, some part of my journey, you know, it's been a great journey. Um, you know, like I said, we have uh, 17 people, some are in production, some are people are in operations, some people are in the youth development part of our team. And then, uh, and there's actually, actually, there's actually one person that at the office that actually tells me what to do, you know, so that's kind of neat. Because uh, <laughs> if she wasn't there, I don't know what I'd be doing, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that's um, that's my beginning of my story, you know. Can, can I start by asking you a question, Daryl? Sure. So one of the things I'm hearing you say is that the environment is imperiled and scientists are not getting through to people. Um, it seems like there's a reaction around despair and hopelessness and feeling like something is too big or existential to know where to, where to start. And maybe people are tuning out even if they know they should be paying attention. And what I see you modeling is that the heart and connecting people around this issue of, of salmon loss and, and dams and salmon not returning home, it sustains the community. And there's, there's hope there uh, because people are together and stories are part of it. And I, I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm also a professor at Western, so I work with young people a lot. And I, I see this, this sense in which I feel myself, uh, how do I instill hopefulness, you know, in a world that has so many problems, which our young people are facing? You know, how do you both address serious issues, but also provide a means 
for connection, hope, a way forward. And I, I, I wish you could talk more about that. How is the political related to uh, your traditions, your, your connection with each other, the fact that this is, happens around a table? Um, you mentioned that the stories stopped when the salmon stopped. Mm -hmm. That seems really important. Right. Well, I think um, we're looking for uh, power to do something. You know, our, our own personal power uh, needs to be found, you know, and that, that power actually comes from us being together. Mm -hmm. we also, we not only share our grief, but then, you know, as people, we begin to, to stand together and we start sharing with each other those things that we can do, you know, and there's a lot of power in that. And we're just gathering power, you know, using salmon as the miner's canary, you know, as the salmon goes, so goes the rest of the environment, so goes us, you know, because salmon lives in all of us, you know, because they give themselves yeah. to the water, they give themselves to the forest, to the trees, to the berries, it's in everything that goes away, then it goes away from us too. But if we can bring ourselves together you know, unite around salmon, then we become whole. But there could be other ways of creating unity, you know, mm -hmm. but it's a matter of getting us together and uniting, you know, and, and out of that comes a great deal of power, both personal power and the collective power of who we are as good people, you know. Yes. So. Th thank you. Yeah. I see that uh, Barbara has put a question in the chat window. Uh, she says, could you tell us more about the members of your production group? Are they of all ages? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. They're, um, it's funny. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the elder, of course. Uh, we have, we have actually got a quite a diverse collection of people, um, both tribal and non-tribal. There's that we have this group of young people that came from the Lummi Youth Academy and started working at Children of the Setting Sun on the podcast. At one time, there was five of them. Uh, now we're down to three, but we have two other youth that were from Lummi and Nooksack, so there's actually five. So we have the five youth that are learning about storytelling first, you know, then they'll pick up the technical aspects and how to do a podcast, how to do a film and all of that. But most importantly, they're learning about themselves, you know, so we have that. And then we have, uh, we actually have a pipeline from Fairhaven College to Children of the Setting Sun. We had three people from Fairhaven College, Fairhaven grads that work for us, you know. So that's kind of interesting. And then um, like four years ago, my son uh, was working for the council, working for the chairman. And there was the consultants that came through the, his office that he said, I want you to meet my father. And so uh, I got introduced to them and one of them never left. And uh, then her sister came over. So that's kind of how the universe is working. You know, the folks that I need uh, are showing up, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to get smarter about that, but you know, there's something about the universe that's informing our work, you know, that I'm just kind of going with. And mm -hmm. right now we're at that place of growth where we have to kind of um, clarify things, you know, mm -hmm. you know how artists are, you know, and, yes. <laughs> yes. and I'm one of those guys, you know, so we need structure. So, yes. so it's and coming together and I got an all native board. I have uh, three elders that I look up to and and are very dear to me that provide us the the guidance, you know, the the guidance that comes from um, wisdom and and living the spiritual life, you know. Then I have uh, some younger folks. One of them actually is uh, again a num an Alumni Youth Academy graduate who went on to get her master's. She's on the board and uh, a few relatives and. And my daughter's the chair, so it makes me feel pretty good. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Bree, I'm sorry. I meant to welcome you. I saw you come in 
in the middle of the presentation. And then I, I was so excited about my question. I didn't, I didn't welcome you, but we're happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Yeah, he's one of the young men that just started working for us a few, a few months ago. I feel pretty proud of him being with us along with the other youth that we have there. Yeah, that's wonderful. Katie, did you want to jump in and, and do some? I saw we I missed Scott's question, and there's some more that have come up too. Sure. Yeah. So Scott's question. Um, first, he just wanted to say thank you so much for this information and for your work, Daryl. Um, and then, can you give us an example of the type of stories that have been giving that have been giving you, um, or just like some of the stories that you've heard? I believe is what the question is. Well, I think um, I think there's just uh, a, a lot of a lot of power in spending time with the people that uh, live in these places that are not part of treaty. They're not part of relocation. It's places that they've never left, you know, and it's a, it's a to sit there with them in their village and uh, hear how much has been lost. I'm talking about the chief from Salilo now. The Salilo Falls village is right on the Columbia River. And when the river was blocked by the dam there that a lot of people moved away, but uh, he and his family and other families stayed, you know. And he sits there and he, he wonders about when the salmon are gonna come back. But you know, through all of that, do you know what he does? He fishes for what salmon still comes up to Columbia. And he told me about having heard of some elders up on the Colville Indian Reservation located north of the Columbia River up uh, west of Spokane. He heard about them. He heard about the elders were starving for salmon because their salmon went away when the Cooley Dam was, was um, was built and they haven't had salmon since, what is that, 1950 or 1960? You know, that's 60 or 70 years. You know what he did? He went and caught fish and threw them in the back of his truck and he drove up to Colville and he gave them away. Hmm. And that's the power of unity and the power of being generous and the power of being thankful for what you have, that so thankful that you're willing to give away what little that you have, you know? And I think we all can learn from that, you know? When we see what's happening in Ukraine, we see what's happening with those people living on the streets. These people can teach us something about how to be better people, you know? And so those are the kinds of points I wanna make and what we're doing today, you know? Same thing happens at Lummi. I have a cousin who, went out, he went uh, brant hunting, he got a hundred brant. And my cousin Jay told me about it. You know what he did with those hundred uh, brant? He went around the community and gave them all away. You know, it just makes us really rich people when we can see that taking place around us, you know, to bring that to life and, and share those stories. I think we'll, we all become better for it. We'll, will become a little bit uh, more adjusted in our life, I think, that these, these stories are so rich with, with generosity, you know. That's amazing. I see another question has come up in the chat. How can the Heritage Trust help your voyage? What are ways that our members and our community can support the Salmon People Project or other work that you're engaged in? Well, I'd like to have Free invite you folks. Uh, he's actually the leader on a gathering we're having in Bellingham uh, next Friday. So he could do his invite to you on that. And then, um, you know, we're also, he's also helping with Salilo, but, um, for us, so I, um, he can do that, and then I can speak a little bit after that, I think. 
would be good. Okay. Guys, hi, how is everybody doing? Good. That's hi. good. It's nice to meet you guys. Um, yeah, so we are hosting a Mother Earth Day celebration on April 22nd from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, at Maritime Heritage Park on West Holly Street. And it'll be an event led by youth, both indigenous and non-indigenous. And we've just got done selecting our speakers about two weeks ago. And um, we'll be kind of doing releases on their names and uh, biographies, like short bios on who they are and what uh, they do for the community, what organizations they're with, if, if any. And the youth, the ages range from middle school all the way up to college. And um, yeah, I mean, there'll be a lot of different themes that they speak on because they do work, you know, for our environment in uh, different aspects or in their own ways. So there'll be um, three Indigenous youth, th three non-Indigenous youth, uh, three opening speakers, uh, which two of them are youth and one of them uh, is a respected elder. And there'll be performances by the Blackhawk singers. And our action item, uh, we decided to do a resource fair. So local organizations who are working, uh, you know, towards the goal of, you know, sustainability and um, restabilizing, you know, our environment and ecosystem, just like local organizations in Whatcom County um, will have booths throughout the event. And our challenge is going to be challenging the attendees to uh, connect with those booths and, you know, hopefully make pledges and learn how uh, they can actually be, you know, of help to these groups or and make a difference in uh, their community. So that sounds awesome. Thank you so much for making that invitation to all of us. Yes. I was, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I was, was going to say I was going to send a flyer in the chat. Oh, that'd be awesome. Because I was just going to say, was it Friday, April 22nd? Yes. OK, that'd be great if you can put the flyer in the chat. Then people can um, click on it and get a copy. Thank you, Free. Yes, of course. Yeah, he's doing a great job and I, the way we work at Children of the Setting Sun is when young people come in there, we want to empower them right away and give them uh, full responsibility right away and, and know that we're there to uh, support them, you know, rather than them supporting us so that we can pass this on so they can carry on, you know, for the betterment of the people. Yeah. That's our approach. Um, I want to also just um, make a, a, a note as well to add on that the link I gave you to um, settingsunproductions.org, it's the website for the Salmon People Project, and there's also a place to make donations on the website too. So I just, it's all in one place and there's a lot of wonderful information there to check out. Um, and it looks like we have some more questions. Um, who among children of the Setting Sun colleagues will appear after Thursday evening's showing of the film Inhabitants? So that's at the Pickford Theater at 5.30, I think, on Thursday. And there's going to be a panel discussion afterward. Right. Uh, what's the date on that again? Uh, that's this Thursday. In a at couple of days. Yeah. Are you supposed to be there, Daryl? <laughs> well, we're in Vancouver on Wednesday and Thursday we're back. And I did, I shared that with Free and Santana and Bo and other members of our team. And we haven't got together to volunteer each other for that, but there'll be, yeah. a, few, there'll be a few of us there, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that'll be that'll be great. I went on today and looked to see how many seats are available, folks. And there, there are still some available, but a lot of them have been pre-bought with tickets. So if you're interested in attending, um, definitely get your online ticket tonight. Um, go ahead, Katie. 
Uh, so we had another question come through, and what are the sources of funding for the Salmon People Project? Well, uh, foundations have been uh, stepping up. We um, have gotten help from the, uh, the Group Health Foundation, the Novo Foundation, the Satterberg Foundation, Mm. They're the kind of the three major ones. And then some private donors have, have stepped in. And the rest of it is just scratching and clawing, you know, with um, bits of money from smaller foundations and online donations and stuff. So it's, uh, it's the less, you know, glamorous part of the job is trying to keep going, funding, you know, but... We have faith, you know, that uh, what, what is to be done will be done, you know, and we're going to give it all we can, all we can give, you know. So we're, uh, somebody told me at the very beginning that, Daryl, you're going to be spending 60% of your time raising money, you know, and, and I thought, no, I'm a storyteller. I'm not going to be doing that. But sure <laughs> enough, 60% of my time's raised, yeah. money, you know, which is okay. I, I like to meet people. Um, I was going to ask too, I, I've seen the Blackhawk singers perform before and I was thinking about what you were talking about with Children of the Setting Sun and how your ancestors, it began with a dance group that, and storytelling and is there a relationship between the Blackhawk singers and some of that work as well? Uh, not, not directly, not in a very deliberate manner. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the leaders, and, and, and Free can speak to that better than I can, his name is Happy Solomon. He comes from the Hilaire family. His great-grandmother was my grandpa's sister. sister. So, but Does he go by Larry, too? Lawrence. Oh, Lawrence. Lawrence, yeah. I met him at Western. Yeah, he was there with the group when I, when I saw them perform. Okay. But okay. maybe Free, you can share with them where the songs come from, you know, and they can give them a better idea. Yeah, so um, there, yeah, our songs aren't directly from uh, the Hilaire family's uh, Setting Sun group, but the way I like to think about it is uh, the Hilaire family, you know, through Setting Sun Productions was a big part in keeping our culture alive, you know, and keeping those songs and dances and regalia and, uh, the paint that we wear, those, uh, cr their family crests, essentially, they kept that uh, prominent and they educated people, you know, all around uh, the Western Washington area and uh, Western, you know, BC area. So I like to think that they're almost, there isn't a direct connection, but, you know, they were a huge part uh, in preserving that culture. And um, the songs that, the Blackhawk singers, the Lackamish singers, and any Lummi canoe family uses our uh, gifts, we like to say, from uh, our ancestors. The songs are older than any of us, and uh, they've been around a very long time, and people are just, you know, have gifts sometimes. They can hear the songs, and, um, you know, it's a real blessing if you, you can hear a song and then you uh, can share that song with your community. And uh, we have some pretty gifted people here in Lummi who uh, are, you know, who have that gift and who have uh, given a lot to our community in that uh, way, so. Thank, thank you, Free. Um, the time that I had the privilege, privilege of seeing the dancers, they ranged in size from full grown adults to little ones. I mean, little ones, like maybe four years old. And we were in a big room with hundreds of people and the dancers moved through the whole space of everyone and around the edges and there was movement everywhere. And they actually opened the event, which had a, a lot of different speakers at it. It was the year that um, Western Reads was uh, reading uh, from, um, to lay up from my heart by Harriet Shelton Dover. And so we had a year of, of programming that, that year. And uh, it was actually family members uh, who came up from Tulalip and some of the people from the Hebal uh, Cultural Center. And so it, 
I was just uh, so struck by uh, how touched everyone was by the movement and the range of ages with the children, how they knew the songs and everyone participated. And it was so different than just having a speaker in front of you <laughs> talk at you. Um, it changed the whole feeling of the room um, to start the event off. Yeah, so I loved, I love that. Thank you. Did you see any other questions come in, Katie? No, not through the chat. Okay. Well, can I ask another quick one? I don't want to dominate all the questions, but I wanted to see if you could talk about your book. Daryl. Well, yeah, uh, Jacental is a uh, is a word that we got from Tom Sampson, our elder from uh, uh, Sarlip up in the Saanich Peninsula on Vancouver Island, who's been a good friend of mine for a long, long time. He was in the play, What About Those Promises and told the creation story. Has uh, uh, come to me to be a runner for him and his work and his work in protecting the environment up there and in Canada and Vancouver Island and elsewhere. So um, we were uh, in Seattle where Tom was doing a, uh, a talk and we were coming back from Seattle, back up to Lummi and, and Tom said, I need to write a book. And so uh, sometimes when and Lauder says something like that, he's really telling you to do something. So I looked at my friends, uh, the late Justin and Natasha and said, oh, we better go to work on this. So we did, you know, and we started interviewing him, but we started practicing on some Lummi people first and thought, wow, they have great stories. And so next thing you know, we had three or four interviews and I thought, well, let's kind of go a little bit further. So we started looking around the entire Coast Salish territory and, and got a balance of women and men together from as far north as North Vancouver and as far south as Nisqually gathering stories. So it became a compilation of 16 interviews of our, from our territory about the different uh, parts of their life way in our community, you know. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it came together and uh, if you remember Chuck Robinson at Village Books, mm -hmm. yeah, I took the transcript to him and I said, Chuck, do you think this would make a good book? He looked at it and said, yeah, that's pretty good, Daryl. Uh, you should probably um, go talk to publishers and see what you can do, you know, and I'll give you a list of publishers and but don't get discouraged. You're going to get turned down like seven or eight times, and but keep going. I think it's it's good material. So then I I put on my clean shirt and I went down to University of Washington Press. Uh, right off the bat, I gave like a 15 minute presentation, and they said we'll call you uh, after we talk to the board. So they met the board the next day and they called me right away and said, "Yeah, we're going to do the book." <laughs> so. <laughs> Hit a home run right off the bat, you know. And oh my you know, gosh, yeah. COVID hit, so that kind of stalled it for two years. It should have been out by now, but it went to design. The edits are done. They went to design today, and they said it'll be in design for a couple of weeks, and then they'll send it to print, which I guess is Asia, China, or something. So we don't know how that's going to all unfold. It's really been, really been a, a long process, but. Right. Yeah. Everything's been delayed that way. Yeah. Well, we're going to really look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah. Free, could you could you talk about this book recommendation? Um, yeah, well, first, I'd uh, like to say I left uh, an Adobe uh, PDF. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see the logo, but it, it's called Jacental. Uh, I left the book purchase flyer in there and it has like a small description of what the book is, how much it'll cost. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, if you guys want to save that, uh, please do, or, you know, share it, uh, you know, with your community and uh, that'd be much appreciated. The book recommendation that I gave was a book that Daryl had recommended to me a while ago, even before I started working for CSSP, I was there helping develop a script and it's called a, 
sand top by uh, Tyson uh, Yankaporta, an Australian Aboriginal man uh, who kind of collects stories from all around Australia and ties them together uh, with his, you know, stories. And I mean, it's all over the place. It, it's a great book. It talks about the importance of oral history and um, different ways of thinking, you know, from an indigenous mindset that, that uh, you know, are sustainable and how, you know, if something wasn't sustainable in uh, their traditional ways, they would never go about doing it. And I mean, he kind of brings a lot of examples from the contemporary into, you know, and he ties it into those like cultural um, teachings and stuff. And it's, it's really, it's really interesting. I mean, you never would uh, guess how the, how important rocks are to, you know, indigenous people, but, you know, a lot of cultures around the world, like, um, view rocks as the oldest spirits on the planet because they are, you know, they've been around longer than even human beings or life on this planet in general. So, um, they, you know, they have a lot of wisdom and, um, they don't, they don't like to be disturbed. And this book really goes into depth on like a lot of, um, that, and it kind of gives you like an, an Aboriginal view on, you know, the world today and sustainability and, uh, storytelling. It's, it's really neat. Wow. Wow. That, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much. I, I wasn't aware of this book, so I will definitely be interested in picking up a copy okay. as, as well as Daryl's book when it comes out. A quote that, uh, he had shared in the end of his book. And I just shared this with Daryl a couple of days ago. Um, he said, culture isn't what your hand makes or touches. It's what moves your hand. I was like, wow. Oh, you know what? I think, um, you know what, everyone? When Free has been posting, he's been post, it's only been coming to the host and panelists. So all of you aren't seeing it. So I think Free, if you click on, you got to click on to everyone in your message box. I did that at first too. I sent I sent the first link to uh, to us, not the group. So I was wondering, like, why aren't people seeing what they're asking? Please post this and please give us the title of the book. And I'm like, it's right here. Can't you see it? So we will make sure all these links and recommendations get sent out to everyone in an email also. If you're, uh, if you're not clear on how to click on something and then save it while you're in a Zoom webinar, we'll send everything in an email so that you can access it. Um, so yeah. Okay, can everybody see now the, the links coming out to everyone? All right. I can see what he's posting. <laughs> We're, we're still kind of new with this webinar format, so <laughs> you can you can tell us where we're going wrong here and let us know what you're not seeing. That was that was good. It took me a while to to figure this out. <laughs> That's great. Were there any more questions that folks had for either Daryl or Free? We have all this expertise and in the room and the opportunity to ask questions. Don't be shy. Katie, did you get to ask everything? Janine says, I admire what you are doing. Thank you so much, Janine Shaw. Janine is on the board as well. So I guess I just have one kind of question that I, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to frame it. Um, but Daryl, what kind of advice would you give to us um, just as like, people who want to like, you know, like, okay, I haven't formed this thoughtful this fully. Um, but like, what advice would you give to people who want to use story as like a good medium 
to like influence people and like how do you get your stories to um like touch your audience in the right way well it lives in your heart not your head to begin with you know uh, secondly you know as free was talking about this book and i'm pretty sure this quote came from that book when it talks about us being colonized he comments that they never colonized our imagination Mm. It lives in your imagination with those things that you feel compelled to do. You know, it's all there, you know. So don't give that away. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, um, I was reading some uh, history books by Black scholars in this country, and um, Black historians are are suggesting that people no longer use the word slaves because, but to use enslaved people because slave seems to assign an identity to people that suggests that's, that's, that's what they were. And enslaved people had all kinds of uh, rich histories and individual lived experiences and families and community connections. And they were people with names. And so I, 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 that was a, an awakening for me to think about what that means, um, to uh, avoid using the word slave and to say what it really was that enslavement was done to a people. Um, and it says, I think what you're talking about, it preserves their subjectivity, their imagination, their, their life stories in a way that they're not just defined by that category. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions in the, the chat. I don't want to keep you longer than the, the valuable time you've already given us. We can't thank you enough. It was such a powerful learning experience and we will definitely connect and share this information and I, I know we'll have a number of people uh, looking to support your work going forward and, and eagerly following um, the different films that will come out as well as the, the other uh, resources and, and just the accomplishments that come from all these communities coming together and having these conversations. So thank you so much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Hi, well, yeah, you're welcome. And, and uh, we'll be sure to stay in touch. Uh, we do have uh, Stamish coming up. We do have uh, some form of a canoe journey that Freddie Lane's um, trying to organize. Oh wow! Is that gonna is that gonna happen this year here? It's gonna be a smaller version, but okay. These things we tend to set up a camp and we tend to welcome people in and, and spend some time together. So we'll be in touch with you on on that, and then we'll be out on the islands, we'll be on Lummi Island filming, you know, when the sockeye come through the reef net uh, sites there. So we'll be around and we'll, we'll All keep right. let you know what we're doing. That would be wonderful. And, and we'll, we'll say hi and continue these conversations. Okay. Thank you, both. Free, thank you so much. It was so great to hear from you. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Okay. All right, good night, everyone. Hi, Shka. Hi, Shka.